schedule for the rest of this week is I'll be lecturing three days. Dr. Belmar will be here on Thursday. And I'm not sure about this week after that's why I got question marks everywhere. I've got to be out of town on two of these days. Uh, so we'll find out and I'll try to get that straightened out with him uh, before tomorrow to let you know what's happening next week. Although, if he's going to do eight lectures and I do 12 or 13, we will probably be done by the end of February with live lectures. And then, of course, you have all the, all the uh, canned lectures you could ever want. Um, okay. With regard to things that we've talked about in the past, uh, we talked about, um, last time we talked about properties of structural materials vary over about 10 to the fifth. If you look at all the Ashby plots, they go about five orders of magnitude. And it turns out, if you look at this curve right here, they go over about a factor of, of 100,000 in cost per pound. So, um, tremendous uh, variability in properties, but the properties are limited. We're going to talk about, talk about that. Now, there's one thing we didn't talk about on this particular plot. Uh, remember, this is Jack Westbrook's 1962 pl plot of structural materials going from stone at what I estimate is about six billion tons a year to diamond, which is considerably less in volume uh, and weight and density. So, anyway, but in any case, um, the ISO market size lines are these dashed lines, and the usage line, or the trend, are these steeper solid lines. And what does that mean? That means that in the long run, if I can double, or if I can cut the cost by a factor of two, I will increase the market size by a factor of four, which means a doubling of the, the dollar volume of the market. So in the long run, it's better to be productive and reduce the cost of materials, maybe not in the short run, there might be a lot of temporary things in the short run, but in the long run, over five or ten years, and uh, why do I say the long run is five or ten years? It takes industry or society about five or ten years to make adjustments. After the 1973 Arab oil embargo, one of the problems was none of the utilities could operate without oil. They couldn't switch to natural gas or coal. But once the Arabs stuck the gun to their head economically and said, we're not going to sell you oil, and they were essentially out of business, they invested in the ability to just at the flick of a switch change from oil to gas or to put in coal burning facilities in, in substitute for oil. So the, the next time the Arabs tried to do it, which was five years later, they were a lot less successful. And when they tried to do it in five years after that, it was a flop, okay? Because the industry had adapted over five or 10 years, they were able to make the long-term investments over five to 10 years. So the, t the time scale is five or 10 years in my opinion. Um, and I also said something that surprises a lot of people in this department when I say materials are a relatively small fraction of the product cost. Typically only about 10%. For semiconductors and some other things, material cost may be 1%. For pipelines and transmission towers, for electrical transmission, it might be 30%. But in general, materials are not a large fraction. It's all that erection and construction and non-destructive testing and design and all that other stuff that mechanical engineers do primarily um, that are the big cost of a product. And so if you pay $25,000 for a Ford Taurus or a Toyota Camry or what other ones should I throw out there so I'm not, not uh, giving a uh, Chevy Malibu, okay? So we're going to try to be ecumenical around all the manufacturers here. It's only about $2,500 worth of materials there. What is probably the largest single item in the value of selling a $25,000 car? Lee I. Coco made this argument a number of years ago. Healthcare, largest single item in the cost of a new automobile is the healthcare for the workers, <laughs> okay? Health insurance. 
uh, the largest single uh, cost, um, well actually I can't remember the largest single cost, it's either the engine or the body frame is the largest cost, but uh, the second highest cost in an automobile is the seats. And it turns out, if you do studies, people will pay a lot more for good seats in an automobile. They want to be comfortable when they get in that accident, okay? Okay. Um, and also, the hardest thing to recycle in that automobile is the seats, okay? Just another factoid for you. Um, but in any case, one of the key points about this type of curve is that in the long run, if you can, if, if you can improve the productivity, you're going to get things better and better. So it's always good to pass things around. It gives you something to throw at each other. Um, turns out um, this is a bar of magnesium, one foot long, one inch in diameter. It's fairly light. This is a bar of zinc, same size, different density. Pretty dramatic, huh? Turns out the magnesium, if I had beryllium, um, that beryllium would be almost exactly the same as magnesium. They have almost the same density. However, a, a bar of beryllium like that, instead of costing a couple of dollars, like the magnesium or the zinc, it would cost probably a, tens of thousands of dollars for a bar of beryllium. Here's a piece of aluminum. Someday I should get a piece of aluminum that's of a similar uh, size, because I probably could afford it. I did look into buying a piece of beryllium once, and they want to charge me $1,000 for a little disc that was a sixteenth of an inch thick and one inch in diameter. Anyway. This is just a piece of nickel, one foot long, higher density. This is a piece of titanium. Uh, I did have a piece of one inch thick titanium laying around from my very first research contract. I'll talk about this later. This is a nickel based alloy uh, as far as that goes. So you can get a feel for difference in, uh, in density. And density is very important if you're going to try to save weight. And it turns out. Um, the more, the faster something goes, the, the uh, more important weight is. And you can see that from this type of curve, which one time I was supposed to give a talk. I couldn't go. Professor Sadaway went, but it was a talk down in Washington or somewhere. So they paid to get fancy overheads done. This was 30 years ago. And so I got the overheads. But anyway. Uh, but this is my talk on the dollar of a pound saved is automobiles, $2, $200 in aircraft, and $20,000 in a spacecraft. However, I can throw out these rule of thumb numbers, and it's important when you hear someone talking about this wonderful new material and how it's going to change the aerospace industry. Well, okay, but it's not going to change the automotive industry because you're talking several orders of magnitude, if not four orders of magnitude difference in cost. However, there are things where that this little oversimplified version of cost breaks down and that's where if we get to uh, collateral weight savings I'll hide some of this stuff for a second um, people have been trying for years to make a jet turbine disc that does not have to have the big heavy flange and the mechanical attachment that's what this is for this is a nickel based super alloy and this one actually <clears throat> I have because it sort of broke, okay? But this was a land-based turbine such as ge generates electric power. And you can tell by passing this thing around that most of the weight of this thing is down here in the root, okay? This is the mechanical attachment. This thing's spinning around at, I don't know, this one's probably only spinning around at six or 7,000 RPM. But that's a lot of centrifugal force. And it turns out the density, if we could, if we had a material that was lighter weight, we would love to use it. And in fact, in the compressor section, where we only go to eight or 900 degrees uh, centigrade, we do use titanium. But in the combustor section, the hot section of the engine, we don't use titanium. Anybody know why? It actually has pretty, could have pretty good high temperature properties not quite as good as nickel, 
Well, the reason is titanium tends to ignite above 900 degrees centigrade. It dissolves its own oxide. It no longer has the protective oxide. And there have been a number of combustor fires in a jet engine where the titanium ignited. And let me tell you, it's sort of like a sparkler going off. It is exactly the same thing as a flare, okay? We use titanium powder or aluminum powder or magnesium powder in flares to give us the big bright light. <clears throat> and once that fire starts, it's all over. You can't put it out. And so there, there were a number of um, fires about 10 years ago in aircraft engines um, that were, it was a bad day for the engine, okay, when the, when the engine ignites <clears throat> in that way, so far as that goes. So anyway, a pound of saved is worth a lot of money, but it depends on where it's saved, okay? If you save it in the disc, the disc has a great big flange on the outside, and the further out it is, the worse it is, because this thing's spinning and centrifugal force means that uh, there's a lot of stress on, on things if you have to have a big heavy flange to make the mechanical attachment. People would love to weld the blade directly to the disc and then you don't have to have this heavy flange and this heavy root section that makes a mechanical attachment. Plus mechanical attachments, when you're going at those speeds you don't want any vi vibration or flutter and so they actually they machine those very, very, very precisely, like to millionths of an inch tolerance. Actually, have to broach them if you know what broaching is, where you basically use a, a knife and and um, of a known shape and size and just cut right through it, so it's absolutely identical. It's the most expensive part of the blade making process is to uh, make that that root. Um, section strong. If you could weld the blade to the disc, you could get rid of all this extra weight that you have for the mechanical attachment, and that's called a bladed disc or a blisk. Now, we'd love to have blisk. Um, there's only one high volume engine that I know of. It's been around for over 30 years. It's the Rolls Royce M250. Actually, it used to be Detroit Diesel Allison, but Rolls Royce owns uh, Detroit Diesel Allison now in Indianapolis makes this cast blisk. So the disc is actually cast with, with blades. I'd like to get one. They've made about 50,000 of these engines or something. It's only about this big. And the blades are integrally cast to the disc. It's the only blisk that I know in high volume production. Uh, they'd love to make the great big disc um, blisk because they could save 20 pounds on a disc. If you save 20 pounds on the disc, then if you have 10 discs in an engine, you could save 200 pounds in the engine. If you save 200, pound out, 200 pounds out there on that little diving board we call the wing, you could save 2,000 pounds on the airframe. So the Air Force is very interested in this because 2,000 pounds of weight savings could be either further range or more payload, right? You trade off either one. Either carry more fuel for greater range or more payload to drop on the enemy, okay? Um, so a pound of a weight saved on that high-speed spinning disc can translate to 10, th 10 times the weight. And so if the average weight of 200 pounds saved on the uh, airframe of an uh, aircraft is worth $200, then if you could save 20 pounds on a blisk, you're actually up in the aerospace type of cost savings. So there's a principle that I came up with uh, once, at the time Sadaway was giving my talk for me, is the faster something moves, the better or the more we'll pay for low density, okay? Uh, for equal volumes, one will pay less for less dense material, and you get about a factor of 10. Actually, this is just a hyperbola, okay? Where you go from a uh, relative cost of 100 for something that has a density of one, which is plastic, to something that has a density of 10. And there, your nickel, that nickel piece back there has got a density of about nine, almost nine. So we don't use nickel because it's lightweight. 
we use it because it has good high temperature properties. And so um, lightweight is important, but it's not important if the thing floats. Okay, we don't really care too much about the weight of ships. I mean, we do, but but uh, it's not it's not that critical because it's only worth twenty cents a pound for the superstructure. We don't care about great big nuclear reactors because they're not moving; they're stationary. Just a big heavy weight sitting on the ground. We do care about the weight of advanced aircraft. This is the early version of the Bell Boeing. Uh, V-22 Osprey, which is now the Osprey that the Marine Corps and the Air Force and other people use. It's a tilt, tilt rotor aircraft. This could not have been built without carbon fiber composites. You just couldn't have built it. You couldn't have designed it out of aluminum. Aluminum's too heavy for this aircraft. The whole thing is carbon fiber reinforced composite. And that's why it started out at $15 million a pop, and now they're about $60 million a pop. Okay, uh, when they actually got into it. Okay, um, if you get to the, I passed around a piece from this. This was, this is an artist rendition of the X-33 space plane that was supposed to be a prototype half size that was going to go into space to replace the proven design that was going to replace the space shuttle. And it, the fuel had to be lightweight fuel and it was H2O. Hydrogen tank, hydrogen tank, oxygen tank. And in fact, you had to get into the design. The tanks actually are the structure here. Okay, you can't afford to build a structure to give strength and then put some fuel tanks on there. The fuel tanks actually have to provide the strength for the structure in order to meet the weight requirements of this engine. Okay, so um, it failed because actually the reason I have that little piece, um, it was actually, the hydrogen tanks were actually built in the same hangar at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Palmdale, California, where they built the first stealth, stealth fighter, okay? Just a little, well, it's actually not that little, but it's, it's not that big either. It's the size of about two basketball courts. Um, but basically they had the stealth fighter and they built this all composite stealth uh, fighter in there, um, and then the space was available, and they were going to build the, H the X-33 space plane. They built the hydrogen tanks at a cost of $50 million a tank, put them in service, not in service, they put them in a test with 5,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen in each, in each one. Anyway, there's only one place in the world, or that I know of, um, and that's uh, Huntsville, Alabama. NASA has a facility where they have, they can test this and they could put liquid hydrogen in the, into this tank and see if it worked. Well, they had a bad bonding problem in one of my other lectures and probably the joining course. I talk about how they had adhesively bonded this and how they made a mistake and they knew they, were, they wanted a factor of two safety on the design. But when they found that the autoclaving of the adhesive bonded joints was not quite what they wanted, they sharpened their pencils and they said, well, a factor of 1.05 is good for a safety factor, which means it has 5% uh, uh, capability of extra capability. Put it in service, or in service, they put it in test with 5,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and it cooled it down and it held and everybody's sitting there, you know, get out the champagne, we, you know, we survived our test, we'll be able to fly this thing. And they start taking the hydrogen out, it starts to warm up, and the thing goes pop, okay? And as it warmed up, it failed, okay? So $1.3 billion program that was canceled because they couldn't build it. Okay, um, that brings up this, this slide. I call, I've quoted this before from Bob Sprague, who was head of materials for Air General Electric Aircraft Engines in Cincinnati for many years. Whenever you first hear about the properties of a new material, write it down. Those are the best properties the material will ever have. He was replaced, and I quoted this one for you. This is actually Jim Williams' slide. He gave this to me once he heard me quote Bob Sprague. Um, he calls it Sprague's first law. Same thing. Whenever you first hear about the material, write it down. 
Um, his corollary, whenever you first hear about the price of a new material, write it down and that's the lowest price that we'll ever have. So material scientists tend to oversell their materials big time um, because they want you to believe that they just discovered the Rosetta Stone of materials and everything will be made out of their material next year. Um, it doesn't quite work that way. In fact, um, there's an article that will be posted um, called Bringing New Materials to Market. I mentioned Technology Review, and this was published, if I can find it, um, in, uh, can I find it? Here it is. Published in 1995 um, in Technology Review, and it talks about the fact that it takes 20 years from the first discovery of a new material to actually making it large-scale economic development, okay, large-scale production. And so that's one of the reasons people like venture capitalists don't like to invest in new materials companies because it's a 20-year payback. And as uh, the author of this, which was me, okay, pointed out in 1995, if you want to return at 8%, uh, $1 of profit, or $20 of, well, if you're going to invest a dollar today, I guess is the way I did it. If you want to invest a dollar today, but not get your profit back for 20 years at 8%, which was at the time typical internal rate of return that companies had for investments, you have to return $20 tw 20 years from now. Okay, that's a lot. And because of that, there's lots of things that we just don't invest in. Does anybody know how long, for 100 years, uh, we've had the same amount of oil reserves in the world in terms of number of years of oil reserves? Does anybody know how many years it is? We've had 20 years of oil reserves for the last 100 years. And the reason is, once you have 20 years of proven reserves, you know, you drilled a well, you found, uh, found this big pot of oil in the ground. Once you've got 20 years of reserves, you, don't, you quit investing in drilling for oil or developing a new technology for oil because that's all you need is 20. That's all you can afford to invest in because you can't get a big enough return 20, more than 20 years ahead. And so we've always had 20 years worth of oil. I remember when I was a student, they were predicting we were going to run out of oil by 1990. Well, we didn't. We ran out of $2 a barrel oil. And the only people who have that, well, the Saudis and the Kuwaitis actually have about $4 a barrel oil now. That's partly because of inflation. They still have it. But the rest of the world is, is up in the $20 a barrel range. You raise the price of something, and people will will start investing in it. Same type of thing with rare earth magnets, okay? The rare earths that are used in uh, lots of electronic things nowadays, uh, the rare earth magnets, um, uh, originally there wasn't a big market for them and there was a problem, and actually in this paper on bringing new materials to market, I use this as one of the exceptions. General Motors discovered neodymium iron boron magnets, okay? And that's what these very strong rare earth magnets are. You can barely pull them apart, pass it around in a second. Very brittle, you'll see some of them cracked. But they discovered these rare earth magnets that had tremendous, these are not structural materials, but nonetheless, I'll show you some plots of, of what these things do. Um, Here's the mag magnetic coercivity of magnet alloys over time. And this was in a, whoops, yeah, okay. Just a worn out plot, I ought to get new plots. This is the uh, BH product. B is the self-magnetic field, H is the applied field. And the strength of a motor or something goes as the magnetic field squared or the self field times the applied field. And this is what we had with Alnico magnets, where the strong magnets when I was a kid. 
And then we came up with samarium cobalt, which we studied when I was a undergraduate here. We went to General Electric, I guess this is samarium cobalt. And they were working in the 1970s on samarium cobalt to General Electric Research. And then in the 1980s, General Motors came up with neodymium iron boron, which is about 40 times greater than the old magnets we had years ago. And um, so this is an Alnico magnet. And if you've got a piece of steel somewhere, I don't know, I have a piece of steel here, a welding electrode. So I'll pass around the welding electrode and you can feel how strong it is. Um, anybody know what this shape magnet is? You can buy these off Amazon. It's a cow magnet. You know anybody know, know why you call it a cow magnet? Put it in a cow's mouth and hold his mouth closed and he will swallow it, she will swallow it. And you, you want it in the cow's stomach because the cows will go out there and they'll graze and they'll eat old tin cans and things like that. And it goes in to, destroys their stomach and their intestines and their udders. But if you have something, a stainless steel magnet that will not dissolve in their stomach, uh, the hydrochloric acid in their stomach will dissolve the steel can. So, so cows eat steel, not intentionally, but it's not good for them. And then I'll pass this around, but this is a neodymium iron boron magnet and it has about eight times the strength. You try to slide these guys apart here if you want. Um, uh, and what happens is I remember when I was your age and couldn't afford to uh, pay to have my car repaired. I, nowadays I pay a mechanic to do it. But back then I had to rebuild the starters on cars, okay? And it's sort of a pain, kind of dirty. But a starter motor weighed about 50 or 60 pounds. Anybody seen a starter motor on a car today? It's about the size of your fist, okay? And that's because they're using neodymium iron boron magnets. In the old days, they used alnico magnets, in my old days, uh, alnico magnets that aren't as strong. Uh, it turns out uh, when the Sony Walkman came out in the early 80s, uh, this was the great music thing, and you'd put your AA batteries in there, they'd last for about two hours. Now, you have batteries and your music will play for, for, I don't know, 16, 24 hours, 48 hours. It's all because of neodymium iron boron magnets, the little motors that, that are in there, um, essentially are run off very powerful magnets. And if you look at the relative strength of the magnets, here's a plot of the relative strengths of, here's your old Alnico magnets from the 1940s, different types of grades of Alnico, and there's a ferrite magnet and a ceramic magnet, and then samarium cobalt, and then neodymium iron boron. And so the size of the motor scales as the strength, actually as the square of the strength of the magnetic field. So that's pretty impressive, okay? Not a structural material, but some of the material's properties have been, improvements have been very dramatic. Here's another material property, the, the most dramatic I know of. The optical loss of, a, of glass, Egyptian glass was pretty hard to see through. Uh, Phoenician glass was better, glass got better and better, but, um, this is de uh, decibels per kilometer. And then all of a sudden, when they got to glass fiber and were sending laser light down across the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, uh, the glass fibers essentially have fantastic transmission and it's gone up by how many orders of magnitude? Um, a bunch of like 12 or 13 orders of magnitude in transmissivity. You can look at the operating temperature of jet engines. Um, this is a plot of the operating temperature of, firing temperature of, of engines. Um, this is, these are structural materials. And back in the 1950s, anybody know when Whipple invented the turbine engine? He was a British engineer. He was basically in the late 30s. He, he had this idea for a turbine engine. And uh, he's, I don't have the quote with me right now, but he's sort of famous for the quote that um, 
it's a good thing that, uh, well, that people had predicted that a turbine engine would be impossible to operate. And he basically quoted after he had invented it and made it operate that it's a good thing he didn't know the conventional wisdom at the time that it was impo what he was doing was impossible because otherwise he never would have tried. Um, but in any case, the materials they had were things like stainless steels. And then they had some nickel-based alloys, IN um, or Nymonic 80, um, and then Mar M is Martin Marietta, and Udemet is, is that General Electric? I don't remember. Rene is General Electric. IN is International Nickel. Um, GTD 111 is kind of interesting. That big heavy turbine blade, I, that's, that may or may not be GTD 111. Yeah. Well, these materials are so they can withstand higher temperatures. Yep. Just, they don't oxidize in however many hour, hours. When I was 19 years old, between my freshman and sophomore year, I got a job working in the Naval Air Rework Facility in Norfolk, Virginia, rebuilding engines uh, as an engineering uh, student. Um, that summer, and with engines, TF-30 engines were coming back from Vietnam, uh, and we had to rebuild them and send them back to Vietnam, and um, the engines had 500 hours on them. That was the lifetime of an engine, 500 hours, and you had to rebuild it every 500 hours. Today, 30,000 hours on a commercial engine before you have to rebuild it. Okay, so it's not just operating temperature, it's operating lifetime has improved over this time in terms of oxidation resistance and other things. But that's from 1970 to 1990 or so, or 1995, you're up to 30,000 hours. And we went um, from better and better alloys to single crystals, single crystal turbine blades uh, that cost $6,000 a blade, okay? You got 100 blades on a on a disc, okay, so $600,000 for a replacement set of blades on one disc in one engine, that's why the engines cost five or $10 million, okay? It's the blades. Uh, the engine companies make maybe 20% 20, 20 of their volume is on the blades, but 40% of the profit is on the blades, okay? The blades are the most, or the veins are the most valuable part. But the firing temperature went up even higher does anybody know why the firing temperature went up faster than the material capability temperature? The firing temperature now is above the melting temperature of the alloy. And I should have brought this in. I'll bring it in maybe uh, tomorrow. They basically put holes in the engines and they blow 1,000 degree Fahrenheit air through there, the compressor air. So it creates a boundary layer that insulates the edge of the, uh, the material from the very hot firing ga gases you know that thermodynamically, the higher the temperature of your engine, or your uh, firing gas, the more efficient the engine can be. And they were always limited before, and basically by the properties of the material, but then they got better and better, and they increased the firing temperature by essentially using a boundary layer cooling against the surface. If you ever lost your, your, your cooling gas, your engine would melt, okay? But you can't really lose your, your compressor because your compressor is part of the engine. If the engine's spinning, it's gonna be compressing air. So you always get your hot compressed air at 1,000 degrees. Um, I served on a committee of the National Research Council back in the, you know, probably 12 years ago, and we were supposed to be telling the, the Air Force how to spend the $300 million they have on each year for improved jet engines. Um, and basically there were two of us that were materials people and we had people on there from Pratt & Whitney and General Electric. These were the people who had headed up the design of the last major engine for these companies. And uh, I remember the first day, 40 of us in this room and they said, let's go around and everybody introduce yourself and, and tell us where you think this committee ought to be going and I was going to explain, well, we've really reached the limit of our materials and we really can't get higher temperature materials because everything else um, oxidizes it above 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And the guy sitting next to me happened to be the guy from Pratt & Whitney who had designed one, of, one or two of their major engines. And he spoke first and he said, well, we've really gone as far as we can in our design and we really need better materials. Okay, and I was gonna say the exact opposite, um, which I did say uh, and explain. He said, well, he had convinced the board of directors of Pratt & Whitney to spend $18 million of their own money trying to come up with a niobium alloy. Niobium melts at very, very high temperatures, but it oxidizes very easily. Okay, and so he wanted to come up with an oxidation resistant niobium. I did my doctoral thesis on niobium aluminum, and so I knew that that was a fool's errand, okay? But he convinced, I mean, he was an des engine designer and he knew he needed higher temperature in uh, engine materials, so he convinced them to spend $18 million of their own profits, okay? This wasn't government money, this was their own profits on developing a better engine material. Uh, I knew it was a fool's errand and he admitted, he said, we spent $18 million and we got nothing. I could have predicted that, okay? So he maybe, maybe he should have talked to a materials engineer at Pratt & Whitney before he had gone off and done that. Um, this is my plots of uh, steel industry uh, stuff, but anyway. I do want to talk about the limits to material properties. And I had talked before about material properties are, the, are basically controlled by the strength of the atomic bond. So here's a picture from 3091 type stuff where you have two atoms coming together at some distance radius in the radius divided, radius in angstroms, um, angstrom unit. So you've got one atom stationary over here and you bring the other atom closer and the energy potential well looks like this. This is sometimes called the Leonard Jones potential from the 1920s from the British physicist who, or chemist or whatever he was, physical chemist, chemical physicist who, did you know there's a difference between a physical chemist and a chemical physicist? But we won't go into that right now. Um, anyway, so here's, a, here's the shape of the bonding curve between two atoms and it turns out the depth of the curve is the energy the first derivative is the force versus displacement, which is the modulus, or which is not the modulus, but the force versus displacement, which is strength. And the second derivative is the modulus, okay, of that. So if we're talking about material properties, there are limits. And we talked about the fact that certain bonds, turns out, strongest bonds, let's call it carbon-carbon rather than silicon-oxygen, Diamond has a modulus of 60 million PSI. There is nothing any greater. Anybody know what tungsten is? It's about 50 million. Molybdenum is about 40 million. Iron, steel is about 30 million. So you can get half of the max with steel at a much lower cost than diamond. Okay? Strength. Strength, you can get the maximum strength based on that Leonard Jones potential right there is about 3 million PSI. Can't get any more. Now, in fact, we get about 10 times less because of dislocations or brittleness or other things. Toughness, which is a measure of brittleness, the energy of fracture, as opposed to strength is the force of fracture. Toughness is the energy of fracture. If we're talking structural materials, toughness Turns out the toughest material is about 300 megapascals root meter, which also is the same as KSI root inch, okay? Um, square root of inch. And the cost, well, you can pay whatever you want. Whatever someone will pay, you can charge. And who pays the most per pound for materials? Golfers, okay? You can sell a new material to a golfer at any price. Okay, golfers tend to be people, men who are greater than 50 years old, who will pay, who have been successful, and they'll pay anything to rub their nose of their colleagues in it. Okay, uh, so you can you can sell anything to a golfer, but there are limits. Um, I put this up before, of strength versus relative cost. This is an Ashby plot, and you just can't go any higher. Uh, the strength of ceramics, but he's got it in a dashed line because it, they're brittle 
and the ones that are not brittle, um, like some of your composites, engineered composites, very pricey. The low cost at high strength uh, turns out to be glasses like fiberglass, mild steel, cast iron, crushed stone, things like that. So why do we use a lot of crushed stone and things? Well, we've talked about that. Okay, any questions on that? So that's sort of a review of where we've been. I will do some fracture mechanics later. But I want to talk about competition between materials. Actually, let me, before I do that, let me put one thing up. I talked about the six materials that are, are in the billion ton per year club. Turns out it's, um, it's iron at about a billion tons a year. It turns out it's stone at about six tons a year, which could be magnesium, calcium, potassium, uh, or no, potassium is not, magnesium, calcium, aluminum, silicon, and oxygen, okay, basically stone in various ways. And the carbon's not here because of polymers. If it was carbon, I'd put hydrogen in here if it was polymers for hydrocarbons. It's here because cement is basically magnesium or calcium carbonate, and that's 2.2 billion tons per year. There's only six elements on the periodic table, or seven, if I include the oxygen. Seven elements that are in the billion ton per year category as structural materials. I mean, it might be sort of a very general way to look at it, but there's only a few materials that we really use a lot of. Um, and the reason is cost, um, unless you're in the aerospace industry or something else. But there's also, there is a, a healthy competition among materials. And that's what this stuff is. Beverage containers or food containers. So we have steel. You might want some chili. But the problem with steel is corrosion. This is painted on the inside, either with a white coating, a paint, or a clear coating that you don't really see. Okay? And it may be coated in some cases with a little bit of tin. Very little bit of tin will um, defeat some of the corrosion. We have composites. Very light. That's empty. I won't throw this one. This actually still has potato chips in it. That's okay. Okay. Um, but it's a composite. Plastic top, uh, cellulose walls, steel bottom. I mean, hey, it's a composite, right? I didn't have a drink box, but I did have aluminum. Problem with aluminum is cost. Okay. Did you know that in Japan, I don't know if it's still true, but... 30 years ago, anybody from Japan? In Japan, 30 years ago, the soda cans were all made out of steel. And that was because the steel companies controlled so much of the Japanese economy that they influenced the beverage manufacturers to use steel cans as opposed to aluminum cans, okay? Plastic, here is real junk food, okay? Uh, spaghetti and meatballs, Chef Boyardee. Um, probably plastic inside the thing too. Plastic water bottles, right? Um, the problem in plastic cups. And I didn't put, well, I did put glass in there. I didn't have a glass. Oh, I did have a glass thing. This is, uh, this is just a glass container for freshening up the air, air wick. But here's ceramic, which is a course three mug. Okay. So we don't have to pass all these around. Um, but they all compete. Why do they all compete? Each one of them is a huge business, okay? Steel can only really make it in canned goods like chili or Campbell's soup because of cost. Uh, it's the cheapest and you can paint them and they will hold up as long as the food will hold up or probably longer than the food will hold up. Aluminum because of formability. You'd have a hard time in steel drawing a can that deep. Okay, with a depth to, to width ratio like that. But aluminum is expensive. Nonetheless, about 40% of the aluminum industry is packaging materials, which means aluminum foil and cans, and it's mostly cans. If it weren't for the can business, Alcoa and uh, Novellus and um, Pechenet and others would be out of business. Okay, glass. Wonderful material to store food in because it's clean, you can wash it, but it weighs a lot and it's brittle. 
So if you go to a brewery where they're making 10 million barrels a year, it turns out the glass factory will be bordering right on the brewery factory. Because you can't afford, with these brittle bottles, to manufacture them even 10 miles away. You manufacture them right there next to the brewery site. Okay? So that you can come off the assembly line and transport them right over to the factory right next, literally next door. Okay? Um, there's a number of industries like that that have to be side by side. Plastic. The problem with plastic is permeable. Um, in some cases, um, like or uh, drink boxes, uh, aside from the recycling and the cost, there's, and I didn't have a, a, a composite drink box, but uh, uh, it turns out uh, the composites sometimes are seven layers to just have a simple little fruit juice in a in one of those little you know rectangular boxes, seven layer composite and. It's got foil, it's got several different types of plastic, it's got paper, you know, it's just, anyway, and it's got adhesive layers in between. Um, it's just incredible. But even they can, can compete uh, with these things. Plastic, the permeability of plastic, uh, it's not really a big deal. It turns out the, the strength, sometimes you need strength, <clears throat> and these things, you, you know, uh, how flex this one's not quite so terribly flexible, but you've seen the uh, the Nestle uh, Poland Spring water bottles or whatever, and boy, if you you kind of wonder if they'll hold the strength to be able to drink the water, right? Um, and uh, those are they made those about as thin as they possibly can. The aluminum cans are actually designed on a supercomputer, okay, for forming and thinness and and stuff. And they take advantage of the pressurized contents. You know, um, the two liter Coke bottles or whatever? They're designed, they got plenty of strength as long as they got CO2 pressure in them, right? You can pick them up, no problem. Some of those things, particularly the cheaper brands, um, you, you pop the thing and you release the pressure and you try to pick them up and you think it's gonna slip out of your hand, you can't get a grip on it because it collapses on you, right? There's no strength to it. So the, the cost of the plastics is an issue, as well as the permeability, okay? Um, the, and then, of course, we have plastic cups. I had a wooden cup. Where's my, oh, oh, here's, even among cups, styrofoam, paper, plastic. Um, bowls, styrofoam, paper, okay? They all compete with each other. Um, and one of them gets a little bit of an advantage by some new processing productivity improvement, and the others will spend tens of millions of dollars to improve things a little bit more. Why? Because you're talking billion dollar businesses here, okay? And just because someone in one area where you have lots of different products that compete, uh, just because someone does something and gets a slight advantage over someone else, the other people don't, don't, don't want to just die and go away. They actually want to compete. And so they will invest more money. That's what happened in uh, transformer steels. Um, uh, we used to, for motors, we used to use just carbon steel. And then we got better in the 1940s and 1950s and had oriented silicon iron steels that had lower magnetic losses. And then someone discovered um, met glass foil, an amorphous metal foil, and it had the lowest magnetic losses of any material in the world. And so they built a $40 million plant down in South Carolina to make this stuff. Um, but it turns out the steel companies that were making the silicon iron for the transformers for the utilities decided not to give up that business, even though the met glass foil had 10 times lower magnetic losses it was like five times more expensive. Well, they improved their silicon iron that they had not really improved on for about 40 years. And so now the two of them are in competition again. Continual competition, continual improvement in properties, mostly driven by what does the market require? If you already got the market, you don't care too much about inventing a new material. You're happy just 
going along um, and not innovating um, and waiting for someone else to do the innovation. Okay? Most big companies are too busy not innovating. Are people familiar with uh, Clayton Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma? Anybody know? No one? You must know it, LGO, right? You haven't heard of Innovator's Dilemma? Okay, so 15 years ago, Clayton Christensen at Harvard Business, Business School wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, and he pointed out that big companies are so busy just maintaining the product they got and trying to improve their high-end business. Let's take Boeing as an example, since several of you are Boeing people. You wanted to make an all-composite aircraft, so the 777 originally was going to be all-composite until they started pricing it. They said, oops, we'll never build this one in the next 10 years. So they decided it was going to be 30% composite and 70% aluminum rather than 100% aluminum. Um, but then when they got to the 787, they said, we're really going to do it now. And they did build the 787, and it's about, what, 80% composite or something? I mean, it's, it's a huge change. The V-22 Osprey in the 1990s, Bell Boeing, that was 100% composite because it had to be. There wasn't a choice. But you're going to pay $60 million for an aircraft that holds 16 people as opposed to an aircraft you know, paying $250 million for an aircraft that holds 250 people or something. Um, so the economics are different for a military aircraft and a commercial aircraft. But it turns out you can do it but there have been all kinds of headaches. Whenever you're the innovator, you get all kinds of headaches. And mostly people let other smaller companies eat at the bottom of their business. And that's the innovator's dilemma. Do you invest your money on improving your existing product, or do you protect the bottom of your market? Okay? Um, and we can, I'll probably talk about that some when we get to the steel business and what happened to the big steel companies. They basically wanted to protect their more profitable par parts of their business and they let the less profitable parts go and it turns out eventually those people doing the less profitable part ate their lunch. Okay, And that's the innovator's dilemma. So, Do you innovate? Do you work on the bottom of your business? Do you work on the top of your business? And it turns out you have to do both. Okay, So I'll see you tomorrow.